Hello, I'm Simon Gibson. I'm the founder of World Speech Day. Um, and of course, today, 15th of March, is World Speech Day. Uh, we've got uh, events happening around the world, obviously, for the most part, via Zoom and other technologies, but some uh, are happening live in, in parts of Africa. So uh, it's still a day to celebrate speeches and speech making. Um, through uh, public speaking events, and uh, it's, uh, it's been a, a great event so far, with um, probably around a thousand speakers going live already on our <clears throat> live stream channel. This particular broadcast is going to be part of the uh, the overall live stream a little later in the afternoon, but it's going out live on Twitter now, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's operating under the title of Rhetoric Remix, which is it's the way that we would like to. Uh, approach the subject of rhetoric and public speaking but in a slightly um <clears throat> tangential manner uh, with a bit of intellect but really fun as well and uh given that um to to borrow uh, a line from um oprah uh, none of the um interviews today have been paid but all of them <laughs> uh, and the question is um humanity at a crossroads uh, what future for public speaking uh, and I hope that we're going to be addressing that, not just in terms of the impact of the technology, but the impact of the whole of the last year on public speaking and discourse. Um, just to give you one example, it, it feels to me like we've all had a, a shared experience, probably from the first time in uh, this uh, kind of progress. Very nearly all of us have shared some kind of, of, of experience and, and restriction over the past uh, year and what does that do for public speaking and discourse and speech making? And um, that's just an example that occurs to me. But anyway, uh, enough of me because we've got some wonderfully star-studded um, interviews today. Um, and uh, I think we're going to start with Ivanka Rodieva, who's uh, chair of the executive committee of uh, the Institute of Rhetoric and is a, um, a professor at uh, Sofia. University, so it's a great pleasure to um, have Ivanka here, and she'll be addressing that subject of humanity at the crossroads. What future for public speaking? Thanks very much, Ivanka. Thank you. It's a big honor to take part in uh, this virtual event, and I uh, would like to start with a very brief citation. What is a rhetoric? And all of us know that, uh, uh, from my point of view. Rhetoric is an ancient yet vital science and at the same time there are a lot of manifestations in different spheres, business, policy, internet and uh, uh, the speech writer and speech maker has a lot of responsibilities and he or she should write and uh, prepare every single speech analyzing the situation and uh, what say Aristotle? Aristotle defines rhetoric as the faculty of observing in any given case the available means of persuasion. I will continue with this any given cases. What cases? Speech, webinars, lectures, conferences, video conferences, webinars. There are a lot of situations and everybody should adapt very, very fast in this situation. And we know that it's not very easy, but all of us try to adapt our experience and rhetorical heritage to new circumstances. And uh, uh, I uh, try to uh, present very briefly from my point of view, what is a virtual rhetoric? Virtual rhetoric includes different kinds of speeches delivered by businessmen, politicians, statesmen, and these speeches are delivered in virtual environments, but more people take part in virtual dialogues, webinars, press conferences, conferences, and it's not very easy to prepare participation and to be effective in these dialogical formats in the virtual environments. And uh, live stream established new circumstances 
in front of speech writer. How to write speech, how to prepare speech, and how to be effective during the delivering, and how to prepare technically the process of delivering of speech. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, return to uh, Obama's speech inauguration address in uh, 20 January 2019, and there how to say heterogeneous audiences people, a real audience, and million, million virtual audiences. And uh, New York Times published videotyped speech, and at the same time, everybody can read the text in the same time, combination between video and text in the real time. But uh, some uh, months ago, again, to January two, uh, 2021, again, an, an inauguration address. And uh, this is uh, the speech delivered by Joe Biden. I tried to compare both situations using as a criteria audiences. Obama, big, real audience. And Joe Biden, smaller real audience, but bigger and bigger virtual audience. But this audience is not homogeneous. Radio and television and social network broadcast these speeches. And speechwriters should prepare the speech, implementing, incorporated the speech in the big political event. This is PR event. This is ceremony, official communication. And speechwriter should write and prepare the speech as a tool to build the reputation, personal reputation and institutional reputation. And speechwriter should combine rhetorical traditions of presidential rhetoric to new circumstances. And there are uh, a lot of new opportunities and uh, speech writers and trainers and speech makers and PRs should very fast adapt this experience and transform to new circumstances. And uh, uh, I would like to Continue with very brief citation. Uh, Tony Blair, as a prime minister, delivered a speech uh, 14 years ago during the opening event uh, uh, concerning the building of Reuters. And what said uh, the prime minister? Uh, in the 1916, the government will sometimes, on the serious issue, have a cabinet that would last two days. But now it's not possible to organize the long process concerning the preparing two days. It's not possible to uh, organize the team uh, for uh, losing a lot of time. It's very, very important to coordinate efforts and to prepare speech under pressure in time. How to prepare messages, how to prepare appeals, how to analyze preliminary the expectation of the audience, how to analyze attitudes of these audiences. And it's not very easy to work under pressure and to analyze the, the, all these elements of the audiences. And all of us know the speech delivered by uh, Queen Elizabeth, and um, this speech was delivered in very complicated political and social situation, and uh, the team used different channels and combined verbal messages with visual messages with multimodal elements and tool. And now, if a speechwriter prefer to be effective, she or he should combine preliminary experience, background, knowledge, and to combine with technical and digital competencies. And I would like to uh, 
finalize my brief presentation with uh, my position what is uh, rhetoric and oratory. Oratory uh, is a multifunctional tool to manifest ideas and to maintain concepts to discuss significant topics in different audiences. And modern rhetoric tries to convince the audiences of radio, television, internet, social networks, and lead them into the practical effects of our policies. Thank you for attention. Simon, I think you're on mute there. This is your microphone. I was on mute and I was giving you my pearly phrases and none of you, none of you could hear them. So anyway, I'm going to re return to my theme, which was to thank Ivanka hugely for her piece and to um, just say that I, I thought that the comments about pressure and time um, were really fascinating, not something I've really thought about, the pressure on speech writing and speech writing team. I always think of that quotation from um, Mark Twain when he said, it usually takes me two or three weeks to write a good impromptu speech. And uh, no speech writing team uh, is particularly keen to have uh, a time constraint. And I can only <clears throat> imagine the, the team around uh, Biden trying to put something together when there was so much constant change around around uh, the speech and I know that uh, Julianne's going to talk about that a little later in her perspective from Australia. So anyway let's move quickly on. I think we're going to go and ask uh, Steve if he uh, would like to to um, be up now um, to, to address that same topic about uh, what future for public speaking. Steve is uh, in New York, he's uh, at Queen's in New York, uh, professor of rhetoric there at uh, <clears throat> University in Queen's and um, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Steve here back with us once again. Steve, thanks very much. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Uh, if there's any lesson we've gotten from the past year about the importance of speech is this very simple phrase that we all know, and maybe we don't love, that facts do not speak for themselves. The facts do not speak for themselves. If you doubt me, I recommend you turn on any television news network for about three minutes, and you will be convinced that the facts do not speak for themselves. Facts are a starting place, not an ending place. And what that means for public speaking and oratory and rhetoric is that the past is prologue, that the past of public speaking and rhetoric is the future. Instead of thinking in terms of facts, rhetoric encourages us to think in terms of meaning created jointly, created together in different venues and different relationships over time that changes with time. In my own work, I rely on rhetorical theorist Kenneth Burke quite a bit to get out of this uh, fact and falsehood dichotomy, which is quite unhealthy for trying to move people into new attitudes, into new relationships with information. And Kenneth Burke defined rhetoric as identification. Identification is when you try to make someone or something almost completely like a palimpsest over something else, that you erase any kind of division or gap between those two things to where you are thought of as the thing that you wish you were. Unfortunately, at the same time, identification is compensatory to division. That is that at any moment when we're trying to identify with some kind of idea, some kind of policy, some kind of belief, uh, some kind of attitude, that we are unknowingly and un unintentionally dividing from whatever the audience might think is the opposite of that. And oftentimes what we're trying to identify with comes into lots of tension with how we present ourselves to others, which leads Kenneth Burke to talk about how rhetoric is forever proving opposites, how much that resonates in the time of the global pandemic. We often feel, I think, in the world of rhetoric that we are forever proving opposites. So besides the idea that facts don't speak for themselves, they need lots of help and that they're a starting place, 
I have three points I want to make today in my short presentation of why the future of rhetoric is its past. Pliability, contingency, and democracy. Those are the three things I want to cover with you today. Pliability. This is something that is not popular right now in our uh, casual politics or even in our national or international politics. We really like the idea of standing firm on the side of the truth, standing firm on the side of what is factually correct. And um, I'll bring a quote that I often use in the teaching of rhetoric from Samurai Master Miyamoto Musashi, who in the Book of Five Rings talked about pliability as essential for mastering any confrontation. He encouraged us to look at, look outside after a storm, after a typhoon or any very serious windstorm and, and uh, think about what plants are still standing. He says, the big trees that have the deepest roots, the big firm oaks, they are shattered, they're broken, they're uprooted. But the grasses and the bamboo survive. Why? Because they are pliable. They can move based on the force of what's against them. And rhetoric, historically, over its thousands of years tradition, Ivanka brought up uh, Aristotle, who's one among many of the, the founders of what we conceive of as rhetoric in the Western world, coming from Athens. Um, it's not the only understanding of rhetoric, but it's probably the most uh, dominant one uh, globally, uh, that these people were very interested in trying to handle a world that they saw as needing adaptation, needing bendability. And rhetoric encourages us to not be so convicted that we forget that we're dealing with other people and we need to be able to move and to defend a position that we think is good by being flexible with how we present it, how we talk about it, and how we sustain and how we support it. Contingency. Uh, if the pandemic's taught us anything, I would say, I know I keep saying that, but I feel like there's a lot of lessons that have been learned from it, is that we live in a world that even with our best data and our best information and our best approach to it, that world is hopelessly contingent. We're always going to be surprised, and then we're going to be surprised that we're surprised ad infinitum over and over and over again. Um, contingency is something that the history of rhetoric education has handled quite well up until recently. If you look to the rhetoric education of the Roman schools, these are schools for elite Roman patricians, they're assigning them to speak and argue about the most ridiculous cases. Quintilian, Seneca, uh, there's lots of collections of these cases. These are cases of people who are um, being ransomed by pirates, the cases of uh, uh, slaves suddenly discovering that they have some rights to property, and uh, having these uh, very privileged people speak about these extreme cases that may or may not ever come up in Roman law. Why are they doing this? Because they recognized, my opinion is that they recognized that you need to be able to defend the principles of the law, the principles of the society you're in, in the most extreme imagined circumstances so that you can practice defending them in the circumstances that you're going to encounter in a contingent life, in a contingent world. I think that's an incredibly important lesson, and I would encourage everyone listening to think if you're involved in higher education or any educational institution, and all education ministries around the world should consider bringing rhetoric back as a centerpiece of a good and basic education for all societies for all societies all over the world, because that ability to adapt to contingency is not going to look like, but it's true, but it's a fact, but that's right. These things do not help bring people to ideas and ideas to people. Another understanding of rhetoric that comes from rhetorical theory. For my final point in the presentation today, I'll move from the idea of contingency and the need to defend principles in a continuously swirling uh, world around us to the idea of democracy. And uh, we forget the key word in democracy. Rhetoric reminds us of that all the time, which is demos, the people. It's not a factocracy. It's not a truthocracy. There are other kinds of governments for that. But if we value democracy, then we have to value the perspective and the attitudes of people. Kenneth Burke says that once you have figured out someone's motives, that gives you an attitude to have about them. And boy, do we see that in contemporary politics, particularly in the United States, where once someone expresses a particular um, idea of what they believe in, we say, oh, their motives are, well, they're an idiot and they're no longer worth talking to. 
This simple act right here over anything else is the death of democracy. The unwillingness to engage others in exploring why they hold the opinions that they do. Opinion is everything for democracy, and facts are in play with that. But facts don't get us out of our responsibility for engaging others in meaningful discourse to try to determine if we have the right attitude about them, or even to determine if we have the right set of motives in play. The uh, final thought I'll leave here is I think that uh, all around New York, and I think all around where you live as well, I've seen handmade signs and government-made signs saying, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. And I think that that was kind of a new kind of sentiment and a new sort of uh, call for community and call for uh, standing together in the pandemic. But to rhetoricians, this is a very old call. Uh, Wayne Brockreedy wrote an amazing essay in the 1970s, Defining Argument, and he titled it, Where is Argument, Not What is Argument? And I would like to echo that and say, where is rhetoric? You will find rhetoric where people are. You will find rhetoric where people are discussing the contingent world around them. You'll find rhetoric where people are adapting what they believe and hold true and hold very firmly in their minds and hearts with those around them who, for some reason, don't accept it at face value. And I think that the COVID-19 is a, is a really an invitation to return to the rhetorical tradition in the way that we've understood it for thousands and thousands of years. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Simon. Uh, thank you, Steve. That was um, wonderful. Uh, a wonderful uh, piece of just kind of tour de force. And uh, I, um, I love going back uh, through uh, Rome and Athens with you. One of the things that strikes me is that before free speech, there was public speaking. Um, you, you know, we all, we all try to defend free speech, but actually we need to defend public speaking and, and bring that to the fore. And I, I, um, I just wondered what you've thought for how we might engage and involve people more in speech. And particularly I'm thinking in kind of communities generally. I mean, how, how do we bring people and um, to, to, to rhetoric or also, you know, just the, the notion of speech? because uh, it seems to me that that's the best way, ultimately, to pro to to protect public spe uh, free speech. If we do what I mean, that we we need to engage people more in speaking. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, I'll tell the story of Bruce Lee, who's the famous uh, film actor and uh, martial arts film actor. Who everywhere he went to shoot a movie, he would rent a storefront in a strip mall and create a martial arts studio there, where he would invite people and say, "You should invite someone you think would enjoy learning here." along with us. And by the time the movie would wrap, he'd have this entire kind of school working in this very like um, unknown kind of location. And then he would leave and leave it there to do its thing. And I've always kind of admired that model in terms of rhetoric. I think it's much, much better than, you know, keeping the best kind of rhetorical training in terms of debate, argument, public speaking, oratory is highly and heavily paywalled in the United States, particularly uh, for, uh, behind higher education. And I think that's a real shame. I think that the, be, uh, the the big first step, the begged question here is, how do we get people to value speaking with one another when they don't think the other person is capable of thought? When they don't think, when they think the other person's political ideas are evidence that they're not capable of thinking. Uh, almost every day I hear someone saying, well, I just don't think people have the intellectual capacity to handle talking about these political issues. We have to figure out how, how to get away from that first. And I think we need to disconnect this idea that, that facts are liberatory and that they're going to save us time. Uh, facts make us lazy. They make us extremely lazy because we're like, oh, you don't believe the fact? Well, my work is done. That's not it at all. Historically, that's not it at all. We have to provide the context. We have an ethical responsibility to provide that context. And I think you're exactly right. Training people how to speak well and to speak to one another and practice that is essential for that. And I mean, I'd like to see more broad-based educational initiatives from governments about making that the center of the uh, the curriculum. I mean, I'm in great admiration of what's going on in the UK right now with or oral C or ORA C uh, or programs. ORA C, yeah. I think that's amazing. We have nothing like that here. I think people just think Americans are born uh, arguing with each other immediately. Uh, I don't think people feel like it needs to be trained, but it does need to be trained. It needs to be practiced like literacy or math or 
or any of these languages that that uh, our society is based upon. Well, fab, fab Steve. We'll, we'll um, hopefully come back to that um, offline. But thank you so much, and that was a, a really wonderful piece. And I think actually it probably sort of segues quite nicely into uh, Harish Harish Natarajan. Um, Harish is the uh, um, uh, a sort of world famous debater. I think he might he might um, agree to that. But he's also the co-founder of a new. Uh, public speaking app or speech app called Polemics. And I'm, I'm just sort of fascinated because what it seems to me that the app does is allow uh, both sides of the argument to be uh, uh, pitched and for people to engage with both sides of the argument. So um, I'd love to hear a bit more about Polemics, which is actually being launched today. And uh, it seems pretty appropriate on World Speech Day that something which allows both sides of the argument should come to the fore. So it, it'd be Lovely to hear a bit about what you do, uh, Arish, and a bit more about what we can get out of something like uh, uh, your app polemics and what apps can bring to public speaking. Yeah, well, thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to speak to you all today on World Speech Day. I come here, as you said, in with two different. One is I spent most of my adult life being involved in competitive debating to some degree or another. And I also come as a representative of Polemic, which, Simon, as you rightly say, is a new social media platform, which is launched today to coincide with World Speech Day, with the aim of transforming the way in which people interact and debate online. It's something we hope that all of the people watching and thousands of others will sign up for, which we really think that it can start making a difference. What I want to start with, I guess, is some of the problems we diagnose, which I think are building on a lot of what Steve just talked about, and at least an attempt to how we think we can partially start solving them. And I want to start by a little bit about social media and the way it works right now. Because I think at the heart of social media, when I think about public debate, is a paradox, which is social media at its very best should be so liberating for the kinds of arguments we would be able to have partly because you just have so many different people from a variety of backgrounds, in theory, being able to share their opinions. And from across the world, where I think we have much more sp uh, space for impressive debate and varied debate than we ever did before. But on a structural level, I don't think social media actually allows us to get there. These two problems, which I want to highlight to begin with. The first one of these is, Social media, which is, I think, particularly in the pandemic age, but it's before that and it's going to continue well after that, is often the forum where we engage in some kind of debate, where we engage in discussion, where we get most of our news and information from. And that's particularly true when you look at younger demographics, but I think it's going to be true for almost everyone in the coming 10 to 15 years at the very most. But we have to think about the structure social media looks like. Partially because we curate our feeds, we decide in Twitter what feeds we want to pay attention to. We decide our friends on Facebook and to some degree on Instagram. You tend to see content which you agree with. So just one side of that argument. And I think this becomes worse, not just because of how we choose our feeds, which to some degree was true in the offline world as well, the friends we decided to talk to. But it's also the structural incentives if you are a technology company. I want to keep your attention, so how do I do it? I show you content that you agree with, or content that you are likely to agree with. And it's my belief that some people want that, but far more people actually do want to hear the other side. Now, maybe that's less true now than it was five, ten years ago, but I still think people want to hear the other side, so at least they can think a little bit about it. So I think on the first level, social media has, if anything, polarized us more when we have the capacity to do so much more than that and actually expand debate and speech rather than contract debate and speech. But second, and I think this is where I think what Steve said is really important, is that the tone of how we debate is now far more aggressive and disrespectful than it ever was before. Part of that is because we don't hear both sides of an argument and we hear people agree with us. And at which point it's really easy to go, well, none of my friends believe this. No one in my life believes this. Anyone who disagrees with me must be unreasonable. 
And I think that first creates an issue of aggression and disrespectful discussion to others. But I also think in the structure of social media, that negative emotion is actually rewarded. I think there's a feedback loop here. In two sentences, you can mock someone for their opinion. You can say, uh, you're utterly mad to believe this thing is true. And having a well-reasoned response, a respectful one, when you try and meet someone halfway, the real world's complicated enough that no one's probably going to be correct about absolutely everything, is, doesn't get the same kind of response because people often don't read it. And you don't necessarily get those like, your dislike, your hatred responses, which I think people often actually strive for in social media. Be aggressive and people respond. And many of us like the idea of getting responses. And that I think is another paradox with social media as to why both of those factors mean that the social media landscape, which is incredibly important for debate, isn't resulting in the kinds of liberating pro-rhetorical, pro-argument discussions and debates, which we ideally would want. So I think the challenge is, can we get people to listen to both sides? And can we get people to engage respectfully together? Now, I think the term people here is obviously a little bit of a misnomer. I think it's about getting at least more people to engage in that kind of discussion and break both the echo chambers and the nature of debate online. So I think here it's worth talking about what we're doing at Polemics and what we hope we can achieve from it. The first step is we have 30 second speech. I think for some of us in the ideal world, when you're a speech writer, when you're an avid debater, the idea of just saying things in 30 seconds may not feel like enough time, but you can at least get a point across, which I think is very important. And equally important is if we wanna get people who are younger involved, if we wanna deal with the fact that attention spans are more limited now than they were before, and attention is at a premium in this hypermedia age, we need something relatively short and relatively snappy. The ability to create a 30 second video, which I think lots of people enjoy doing, if you look at the growth of, for instance, of TikTok, is something which can get more young people involved in the idea of arguing. And I think, that's the first potential hope we have. The second is that you will see arguments for and as many arguments against. And we think that is at least partially going to be liberalizing, that if you want to see both sides, there's a social media platform which provides it for you. The third part of that is what are the incentives? And I think, as I suggested before, the incentive of often social media now is to be extreme. The way polemics differs is of the content you see, you have two options. You can be convinced by it, i.e. you agree with the argument being made, or you can respect it, which is, I don't agree, but I think this is a well-made point. I think you're a very good speaker without a negative option involved. And content will be prioritized both on the number of people who disagree but respect and the number of people who you convince. And actually, I think that small change perhaps has a big impact. Because if you want people to see what you do, if you want to get positive responses, it's about being respectful and about being convincing rather than just being aggressive. And the final part of this is what kind of community we're starting to build. At least to begin with, we have a small community of a few thousand individuals. These include some of the brightest young minds, some young professionals, and we hope that many of you who are at World Speech Day, who like the idea of public speaking, who like the idea of respectful discussion would be joining us as well. And they're being joined by a group of world leaders. This includes the founder of En Marche, uh, President Macron of France's party. It includes the global, pres global president of the New York Times. But we're trying to create a community of bright individuals who are happy to be respectful and are happy to talk about both sides of the argument. It may not be for everyone, but for those of us, like me, and I think like all the people watching now who are passionate about debate, who love the idea of talking, sharing their opinions, but equally love the idea of listening and finding out why someone believes what they believe and why they believe the opposite for us. I think polemics is something which is going to be great for them. So as a representative of polemics, we really hope that we can help at least to help start this transformation of debating in the social media age. And we hope all of you are going to sign up with the code, which is now available, and download the app on the App Store. So. This is my broad view of where I think the problems are going and hopefully at least the start of a solution towards mitigating the real issues with public discussion and debate that we currently have within almost every society.
Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Arish. Um, I, I absolutely love the notion of, of respect uh, within your app. Uh, it feels like it's it's a kind of it is a game changer, um, and it's also it's a kind of bedrock of rhetoric, um, the respect to listen and uh, and under, and attempt to understand. And you you kind of feel that those guys standing in the sunshine in Athens and the Paniques would have been exercising respect at the beginning of uh, public speaking. So uh, um, it is going back to the beginning, as Steve said. And bringing in respect into uh, debate and discussion, so it's fascinating. I haven't had the chance yet to 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 play through your app, but um, um, I loved your chat. So um, I'm I'm all up for for taking a, a look as soon as the broadcast closes. Thanks so much, Harish, for 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 being part of this discussion. Um, and I think we'll probably now go to Dr. Dennis Becker, um, who's the co-founder of. Um, the speech improvement company uh, in Boston. Uh, I think he's uh, in Florida right now, but anyway, uh, his company is, I think, based in Boston. And um, I think Dennis is going to talk to us about some of the changes that uh, the technologies have brought around in terms of the changes that Zoom and other kinds of uh, platforms have brought to public speaking and, and and what we need to take on board as a result. So, great pleasure to see Dennis here again and. Uh, uh, to invite him to, to say a few words uh, to us this afternoon. Mute. There we go. Now can you all hear me now? There we go. Very good. <laughs> thank you, Simon, and thank you for having me back again this year. I, I Listen, I didn't plan on this, but I am so comfortable and excited about being in the presence of so many other Aristotelians like me. I studied rhetoric and absolutely love the topic and all of the stuff that we're hearing so far. So I'm excited, but I got to get back to my own topics because what you folks have been saying, Ivanka and Steve so far, Harish, I love everything that you've said. So we'll, perhaps we can talk about it again later. But in the time that I have, I want to talk about three, th three things. I'm going to make three particular points and I'll try to tie them together and let you know why I'm saying these three things. The first point is one that may surprise everybody. I don't know. There's no such thing as public speaking. Now, whoa, let me back up here a second because that term's been used more than anything else so far today. There's no such thing as public speaking. Think about it. Every time you talk, you take your thoughts out and you make them public. Every time you talk, it's public. So. It's all public speaking. Now, I certainly understand what we mean when we, you know, public speaking, you're in front of a big group, you're on a stage, you're at a conference, whatever. I get that. It's a very formal concept. I get that. But that's not what it is. Rhetoric and public speaking have become formalized. And that's one of the reasons we don't have more people participating in it. They get too nervous. But people talk all the time. It, they're public speaking every time they talk. So those of you who are listening, who are a little bit nervous about this thing called public speaking, forget the title. It's you talking. That's all it is. Now, yes, there are some things you can learn. There's a lot of things you can learn. And as Steve was mentioning, there's so many things that have been passed on from uh, Aristotle, our, our God, uh, but others, Cicero and Quintilian and, and uh, Plato and Socrates. There's so many other things you can learn. And believe me, it's a good thing to learn about speaking however you define public speaking, because we've had too many examples of folks who have learned it and used it in very nefarious ways. So we all need to know about it. That's the first point that I want to make. The second point that I want to make is that we have seen so many changes in the way rhetoric and public speaking have been treated and taught and learned. Um, the company I'm with, the, uh, Simon mentioned, the Speech Improvement Company, we're the oldest speech coaching firm in the United States. So we've seen lots of changes and things that have affected us. We have clients around the world. So we've seen all kinds of things that have affected this thing called public speaking. I remember, I can remember, I'm old enough to remember when videotape came in. Well, even I was when I started, it was tape, it was actual tape going around in a circle. 
<laughs> wasn't digital in any way. But when videotape came along, wow, that was really special because you could see the person, how that changed teaching and learning mm -hmm. for sure. Then, of course, came along telephones would have cameras in them and there have been all sorts of changes. And now we have a pandemic. COVID has created another change. Mm -hmm. Now we're no longer meeting each other and talking with each other in person. You know, the old days when you could shake hands and smile and pat somebody on the shoulder and share a cup of coffee and all of that, it's gone for now and maybe for a long time. So public speaking or speaking with one another is being done like this. You are seeing me in a little screen on your camera, your camera's there. I'm. And I'm going to talk about that camera in just a second. But I'm not live with you. You're not live with me. We can see each other. But there's not human dynamic, that intra-interpersonal exchange of communication. It's not happening. So we must learn how to public speak, whatever that means to you, online. And that means there are some things to be learned. And as Steve was mentioning, we can learn a lot. There's a lot to be learned about effective speaking whether you call it rhetoric or public speaking, mm -hmm. there's a lot to be learned about giving speeches and speaking and listening. And so I want to talk on the second point about how we can even be better at it in this new environment called online. Mm -hmm. Now, some very specific things that I want to share with you. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's a camera that you're talking to. Now, I notice when so you'll see when some folks talk, they have a second screen in front of them. So they're looking, they may be looking at me if I'm listener, and they're looking at me and my face over here on a different screen. So they look like they're talking to me. But as you can see right now, I'm not really talking to you. I'm talking to another screen that looks like me. To talk to me on screen, I have to look into this little yellow dot right here. That's the camera. That's you. Yes, I see you over there. For you to think I'm looking at you, you have to learn how to speak to that little green light on your camera. That's the first thing to learn, that this is where we live with each other, not off, off screen or someplace else. Let's talk about this screen thing. Now, there's a difference between the screen that you see with me and that your screen that you've seen with other people. There are some guidelines. Now, we all know, look, Nobody wants to see your pajamas in the background and your your beds unmade and you know your coffee cup waiting and or your pet or your kids running back and forth. It happens. It's real life. I understand. But to be most effective, you need to have some attention paid to that. Here's a quick pointer. When you are on screen, your eyes should not only be looking at the camera there, but on screen, here's a nice way to know. Your screen, this whole screen here, mm -hmm. is divided in three parts. One, two, three. Your eyes should be at the line that is the bottom of the, here's the first part, comes down, comes down, comes down. Here's where your eyes should be. There's the second part, sort of the middle of the screen, and there's the third part. Your eyes should be at that third part, the first, the, the, the bottom of that third right there, okay? Now, the other thing to think about is what's called headroom. Headroom, head. See this space here? This looks like a couple of inches up here. Too often what we see is this, people talking like this. Or we'll see this, you know, the way down here, look at it. No, no, you can do it, but it's not effective. You want to be effective these days? Give yourself appropriate headroom, look into the camera, see how equal the spaces are. You don't want to see a lot of dis disconnected, uh, uh, annoying things in the background. Make it as clean and as possible, as, po as clean and as uh, respectful as you can. All right. The last thing I'll talk about on this issue is sound. Now, I want to demonstrate something to you. I, most of us on this, uh, this uh, segment sound pretty good. There's a difference, though. When you want to sound professional, confident, don't, you want to sound like this, don't sound like this. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug my microphone. Now, watch what happens when to the sound. Listen to what happens.
Hello, Dennis. I think you didn't plug your mic back in. Can you hear me now? No, it's not. It's not plugged in yet. It's still it's still not plugged in, I'm afraid. Try it again, try it again. I think it may be because you unplugged the um the mic while we were online in the in the stream and therefore it's it's actually disconnected your audio in some way so um if you want to try once more otherwise i may remove you and then you could probably try and rejoin the room okay uh, i think we might have lost you dennis but uh, um your your uh, example was was just too 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 good and and it was a great shame because um I, I was loving what you were saying, and uh, I, I don't know how to get you back. All I know is that I'm breaking most of the rules myself by leaning towards the camera, and my headroom is maxed out already. So um, I think I think uh, we'll we'll go on to Eric, and if we can uh, come back to you in a moment, I'll I'll, uh, I'll 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 see how that works out. Now um, I'm good. Now you're back. <laughs> now you hear me, right? Oh yeah. Don't ask me why. <laughs> I don't know why, but I know it works. <laughs> Technology is a wonderful thing, isn't it? It, it, it allows is. To do it, so is. Many it is. It is. It is. So, uh, well, fa fascinating. Um, well, the, but the point that I'm making, let's, Simon. Let's finish, let's finish off with you, uh, Eric, uh, Dennis. Let's let's give you give you the the, the last section. Oh. So, are you stopping me now? No, no, you carry on. All right. Thank you very much. Technology is such a wonderful thing. I remember when they sold us on, there's going to be the paperless office and we'd all be so more, much more productive. They didn't tell us about this part. So all of these things that I'm sharing with you under the point number two that I wanted to share is about this whole thing. You see what can happen. Unplanned things can happen. And people, that's another thing that people fear, which is why they don't want to speak in public because it feels like it's too scary i don't know how to do it what will happen if what goes wrong well things go wrong so we fix them that's all so the whole point of this is that uh, i want you to be thinking about when you're doing public speaking whatever it is for you that you are prepared and do the best that you possibly can things will go wrong they happen it's okay it's human that's what we all are. That's the one thing that we have in common. No matter how fancy our microphones and our screens or our set is, we're all human. We're still talking to people, whether it was 3,000 years ago or three minutes ago. The one commonality is we're all human. And there are motivators. There are things that we can do to be more effective in speaking and listening with one another. Okay, the third and last point that I want to make is basically a thank you, Simon, for organizing and coordinating better uh, this uh, World Speech Day. It's amazing. Uh, it's the one thing you notice that I'm aware of in the world, maybe some of you know of something else, that really connects people and puts the emphasis on speaking. It's not on any particular topic. It's not on any particular policy or politic or issue of the day, climate change, or all the more important, you know, the virus. I get all of that. But you are giving people the, the validity, the value, and the importance of being able to speak your mind. And as I said earlier, it's very important. There's a lot to learn, as Steve was mentioning. There's a lot to learn. And you should learn it. We should be teaching this much more in school, much more at every grade level as far as I'm concerned. But at least every few years, we should, we should be teaching children about speaking and listening. We're not doing it. But we should. Because, as I said earlier, if you don't learn, someone else will. And we've had examples of that throughout history. And I'm not going to cite it and get politically sensitive here, but we all know that there have been people who have learned the skill of 
public speaking and utilize that skill in very nefarious and sad ways. So it behooves all of us to learn more about it and to value this idea of speaking and listening. So Simon, I want to thank you for making this happen each year. And as long as I can be part of it, I love to be part of it, particularly that I have so many Aristotelian friends around the world. I think that's fantastic. So thank you once again, Simon, and I'll stop here. And I apologize for the technology, but it happens. This is what happens. So thank you all for giving me the chance to speak to and with you. Thank you for listening and bye for now. Dennis, thank you. That was, was wonderful and uh, I, full of admiration for your able, ability to pick up the baton and continue and win the race. Uh, so that, uh, that, was, that was fantastic. And I think it was actually a wonderful example of pliability. Um, you know, that you just uh, go, with the, go with the breeze, go with the wind, and, uh, and, and, and uh, that was wonderful. And we learned a lot about um, you know, how we prepare ourselves and how we put ourselves on the screen. And thank you for that. Things that I had not thought of and things that I'm obviously breaking now, but I will go back and learn from your remarks about how better to. But you know, Simon, the thing is, Simon, that when things like that happen, problems occur, uh, even before they occur, people are fearful of this whole thing of public mm -hmm. speaking and all of that. That's why I want to take the aura away from it. We're all speaking publicly every time that we talk. We need to learn some lessons about, you know, big tent presentations or intimate or well, different types of speaking. But speaking is a human characteristic. It's the thing that, that differentiates us from the forest and jungle animals. We all need to be able to do, to do it better, to utilize it, and to value it. So thank you, Simon, for giving us this opportunity. Well, great. Uh, thank you for, for your the kind remarks, Dennis. And uh, I do know that um, you know thousands of people who uh, probably wouldn't get involved in public speaking do so because of World Speech Day and schools, universities, and public speaking uh, venues around the world. So it does have a little bit of an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, easy to to think of it as too too grand but it, it does have a bit of an impact so i continue to feel that it's worthwhile and I, i'd like to to ask eric i think tom has uh, technical difficulties uh, joining us so um uh i'd like to ask eric to to uh, to speak now eric is uh, a university professor in Ayland, i think it is uh, it is a small island just off uh, finland um and uh, he is uh, uh, a specialist in visual rhetoric. So I hope that Eric's going to bring along some Bob Dylan type uh, 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 <laughs> cards and, uh, and, and, and take his way through it with us. And th thank you, Eric, for, for being so patient and for joining us. And uh, um, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing a bit about visual rhetoric. Well, thank you. Thank you, Simon. And thanks to all the rest of you who have spoken so far. Uh, I have not been impatient at all. I have, uh, I have very much enjoyed uh, listening to you. I'll tell you where I come from. I teach students who are not particularly interested in rhetoric. And they are, it's a professional training at university where people learn the trades of the sea and tourism, etc. So uh, I know what short attention span means, not be sort of extremely good at listening for a long time, for a long time to teachers uh, who have a lot of clever things to say, using a lot of fancy words. So uh, I'm going to use uh, my Bob Dylan style today too, like I did last year. And uh, I will uh, think back now on the year that has passed since we met last time. Uh, my belief is that we have all changed quite a lot. So uh, uh, my theme here is this. How does the feeling of proximity affect your communication? And rather the general isolation or deprivation that we have uh, suffered, how does that change our communication? Uh, my idea is that we have actually started to like uh, this much more in a year, this uh, Zoom age type of, of the communication. And uh, that is uh, something that uh, uh, surprises me because I, I must say, 
now that I haven't seen people so much, then I, I uh, feel closer to people now. I don't know. That's that's the receiving end. But when I want to deliver something here in this through this medium, then I need to think about the challenges that we still have here. And these are, of course, the well-known words that everybody knows. The rituals is uh, what we do. Ethos is who we are or who we appear to be. Pathos is what we make people feel. I mean, truly feel. Boredom is quite often the case in education. And the kairos, that, uh, by that I mean, why now is the right time to talk about what we're talking about? And I'm going to concentrate on distances. And uh, physical, hierarchical distances, cultural and style differences. <laughs> and then I mean we should reduce the distances, but we should also reuse and recycle the tricks that rhetoric has taught us. So we're talking about uh, getting close, right? And Dennis advised us not to cut off our foreheads like this, uh, and we should definitely look into the camera, although we don't actually see us. And we should remove our glasses like the doctor does when he wants to tell us something really awful about our diagnosis. We are used to managing distances from our regular life too. Many people do that like this, you know, they put on the, these. And why is that? Well, there are maybe more, as many reasons as there are people, but one thing is that we actually reduce mm -hmm the closeness there, we add distance, and that feels comfortable. So we should definitely be able to, to uh, um, change the, the distance according to what the situation requires. Rhetoric uh, has, gives us a toolbox of many, many things that we can, we can use. I was thinking of a hierarchy too. If, if you look, if I look at you like this, then Oh, let's see now what is what's happening here. Then maybe I feel a bit more like I look down at you when when we speak. Often the the case is like this that people you see into people's noses and and they sort of look up to you. Uh, it does add some kind of feeling of of hierarchical difference. I think. Uh, then of course. Uh, Cultural cultural distance that might might be how how strange do we actually feel uh, or not strange, and then the style can be uh, something that makes people feel at home or 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 not not at all of course. So we have the face here. Sorry, that's it, and we have our eyes, I covered that, and uh, we have the context too. I wanted to show you my wooden horse here. It's in the background. I think, you know, when we see people online, we often start to think about what is it that we have in the background. I was going to ask Harish if it was a vacuum cleaner or was it maybe uh, something uh, that he used for exercises and uh, you know this wooden horse I, I really like it a lot because you know my dad sat on it in the 30s when he was five years old he got it as a present and I still have it here and I don't know this this might feel like something that doesn't really have anything to do with what I should be saying but it I think we we are our context also is, some of you mentioned the context there. And also I wanted to mention the voice, of course, then we have a close, like I think Dennis was very good at that. And of course, not uh, being scared of silence is fantastic. Slowing down and contemplate. I was told, or I saw a video with a good, uh, with a good um, actor, he he sh he mentioned that we should actually hold our breath if we make a pause, because that intensifies our presence in this uh, medium. So, uh, furthermore, then uh, uh, psychological closeness. It is uh, something that we can enhance by small talk, team building activities it, before we actually say what we 
want to say. It is uh, the difference between uh, selling something in a cold cold call or actually warming up your your client first before you make your pitch. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think uh, I also wanted to show you this transactional analysis uh, um, uh, what is it scheme or or design here where where it is uh, emphasized that if we want to talk to people we should talk on equal basis and i think dennis said that when when we should have our eyes in the right level etc as a teacher then i'm interested in cybernetics that is to control processes uh, in a di at a distance and i want to be able to do that I just saw this, it was kind of online course, why educators should appear on screen for instructional videos. Many teachers don't do that. They miss this whole face thing, as you know, Facebook is a big success. Why is that? Well, it is obviously because uh, people need faces uh, to, to um, connect, to listen. And uh, well, uh, I wanted to return to the humanity at the crossroads. Now, we're not going to go back to the normal that was before, obviously. Today is uh, the time when we have learned many, many things. And now we can use these. And we have a fantastic opportunity because I'm talking to you just, it's just as awkward to talk to you as it is to talk to my own students in my hometown. So we have uh, sort of burst open the boundaries that we are truly a global society now. And if we can make people listen to each other and to us, then uh, the communication can, can really, really change things. And uh, I think we need to use visual um, help to do that, to uh, involve many, many things that are seen, not just the words. So that was my message this year. I hope to be seeing you next year and uh, in the years to come. Thank you. Uh, was I, uh, Am I the only one who can be heard now because I can't hear any one of you. Sorry, that was me uh, being. <laughs> but uh, I, I was just saying um, we're not going to let you off that lightly, Eric. We'll continue to have your unique style uh, on Rhetoric Remix, and it was it was fabulous to see um, the keyboards out and uh, and uh, so much fascinating uh, <coughs> comment about proximity. And, oh yes, uh, I wanted to finish with this one. Sorry. Oh, yeah. This, this is uh, the mic drop by Obama. We all admire him. And, and I, I would include that under the heading, under the heading rituals. Then if you, if you start with the right rituals and end with the right rituals, according to what I've learned about rhetoric, then this is really what's going to drive home the message. And uh, he, he has showed, uh, how to do it. Maybe it wasn't his idea, but he really, really knew how to use that in a fantastic way well sorry now i'm going to stop thank you thanks eric i'm i'm sufficiently ignorant that i don't know the story behind the uh the mic, mic drop, drop. Oh. yeah did he do that in a, in a speech and just drop it to 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 open up the audience or what what, mm -hmm. what was the context it was probably a, a question of uh his style, which is very appealing to many, and his ethos. And of course, it is something that appeals to young people because obviously the mic is going to, to uh, be destroyed, probably. <laughs> so it is like a careless attitude, <laughs> which, which appeals to many, unfortunately. I hope they had something soft there, Andre, so it wouldn't be ruined. But, well, the idea uh, is also, the idea is also that I've said what I've gonna said, folks. You notice he has his lips here. I've said it. I'm done. Boom. Yeah. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I have no more to say. <laughs> it, it, so feels cool. a bit like, it, it feels to me a bit like a rock star burning their guitar on. <laughs> on the you know, I mean, yeah. talk about yeah. somebody who, who lives and dies by the mic. But, <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's, anyway, uh, I, I'm fascinating. I'll, I'll, I'll look that up. Um, 
and I, I liked your comments about globalism and uh, uh, increased globalism. I, one of the things I found absolutely fascinating over the past couple of days is that it is relatively easy to bring together people from all over the world uh, on extended time frames and to get a global community. Um, uh, and that's something that I think has really changed. This time last year when we were involved in Rhetoric Remix, it was not unusual, but it certainly wasn't common. Now we all are quite used to being connected, globally connected, um, and making uh, comments and speeches. So that, for me, has had a profound effect on um, uh, on, the, on our outlook, I think. And sorry, Dennis, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to make a suggestion and actually a request, if you others don't mind. It would be really helpful to continue this kind of a thing if, Simon, if you wouldn't mind sharing email connections or contact information with the rest of us about the rest of us so that we of could course. be in continued communication after today. Of course I will. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do a, a round. Good one. idea. Thank you. Uh, may I, may I uh, ask something? Yes. Uh, I would like to add that I'm the editor in chief of uh, Rhetoric and Communications Journal. I write to Simon, and I have a proposal to present uh, as a good practices uh, the World Speech Day, and I will send you personal invitation to write paper and publish. Uh, in uh, this online journal, uh, journal has a uh, ten years history ago and uh, five hundred articles are published uh, in English, and it uh, will be how to say good idea concerning sustainability and dissemination mm -hmm. and uh, how to say research and practical networks in the mm -hmm. future because uh, this is the idea to establish and continue to work in the future the more we do it the better that's a great idea ivanka thank well, you we'll, well i'll 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 um i'll put that as part of the email that i sent out afterwards yeah. but uh, you know that i'm uh, i'm keen to take take part and uh, it's very you know it's a, a very kind invitation to me to 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 contribute to the your um, online journal so i will definitely do that and as and you I'll, probably know, even even in Bulgaria, the word, the term rhetoric, is for, well, in Western world anyway, has been bastardized in some way. It's a bad word to say, oh, that's just rhetoric. No, that's not even rhetoric. <laughs> so the more we can straighten that out and maybe bring rhetoric back to one of the original liberal arts, I mean, I'm all in favor of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Well, I've got just one last uh, treat, which is a recording of Julianne Stewart from um, <clears throat> uh, Sydney in Australia. Julianne uh, very kindly recorded this a couple of days ago, but I'm going to play it in live now. Julianne uh, is a speechwriter. She's been a speechwriter to uh, four um, Australian prime ministers, and she's got had a whole... Uh, um, life really in writing and speech writing and uh, she's got some fascinating things to talk about in terms of the way that speeches have had to adapt because no longer can we as uh, professionals in in speech writing prepare someone to give a, a, you know a presentation in front of 500 people and then ask them to do the same on zoom because it just doesn't work and um, she's got some fascinating insights on the fact that it's just now it's a one-to-one -one conversation Speech making is one to one, and uh, for all the changes that that brings. So um, I'm going to uh, beg your indulgence. I'm going to play um, uh, the the piece in if I can master the technology, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, uh, thanks very much, and uh, um, I'll just uh, try and uh, try and bring it up to full screen. Hello, I'm Julianne Stewart. I'm coming to you from Sydney, Australia. You didn't sort of see that little white pointy building over there on the harbour. Might have given it away. Uh, thank you to Simon for inviting me to speak with you today. A happy World Speech Day. Um, 
Yeah, my background started off in uh, television uh, script writing on dramas. Uh, and who would have thought that that would be a great grounding for writing for politicians? But it was. Um, you know, probably should have guessed drama and politics go hand in hand. Uh, but yeah, for the last 16 years, uh, I have been very fortunate that I have worked where speeches are really valued and I have worked in dedicated speech writing roles. So I'm talking to you today from a very practical perspective about how speeches have changed over this last year of the pandemic um, in a, a practical sense and uh, and the opportunity it actually gives us as speech writers um, and particularly in the context of the theme of World Speech Day which is humanity at a crossroads. But the, um, let's talk about the practical side uh, just briefly. You know, you're sitting probably in your lounge room or in a study by yourself. I'm sitting in my study by myself. Uh, so it's the online platform doesn't really lend it itself to the real formal speech giving. I think we all tried to keep doing it at the beginning of the pandemic and we found it wasn't really working. And so for me personally, my speaker has gone more into um, panel discussions or very short presentations and uh, we've gone back to a reliance on uh, PowerPoint. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's changed, you know. Um, it wouldn't, it, it'd be like me standing up here, you know, it, it'd be the same if you went into a room of two people and stood at a podium and said, um, good evening, distinguished guests, lady and gentlemen. You know, it, it doesn't work. You've got to just speak um, in a very informal manner these days. Um, maybe we'll get back to 500 person auditoriums one day, but it's, it's a long way off. Um, in a in terms of language, I think things have really changed too. Um, and I think it's for the better. Uh, and it's because the pandemic has been such a leveler. We all now have um, a world that is experiencing the pandemic, everybody is experiencing the impact of the pandemic to differing degrees, of course. But we've all had some sense of loss, whether, you know, it's the ultimate loss of a family member, and it could be from COVID or what we've had a lot of um, where I am because there's a lot of people who come to work on the, um, the University of New South Wales. Uh, and we have a lot of international academics and a lot of international students, not as many international students as we used to have, uh, but people who have lost loved ones in, in another country and they can't get to them. So there's a, there's a sense of loss it could be, as I said, it could be people that you have lost. It could be the loss of a job. It could be the loss of connection with family and friends or the
the loss of freedom from being in lockdown. And what that's done is it's actually made people talk about their feelings a lot more about, you know, they might be fearful, they might be sad, they might be angry, they might be lonely or even, you know, if they've had a reunion, joyous. But then I think people are more in touch with their feelings and there's that's where the opportunity is for us as speech writers is you know when when we write a speech the first thing we ask is who is the audience because you want to connect with them and now our speakers you know we, they know when they walk into a room from now on or if they're talking to people online, everybody can relate to everybody else's feelings about the pandemic. And it means that there's a facade taken down or a barrier that has is quite often there between the speaker and the audience because the speakers can speak on a much more personal level now um, and I think that is one of the best things that could happen for us as speech writers because what we have a chance to do now is is influence it it might only be a, a small gathering but whatever that sphere of influence is if we can inject empathy into our speeches we might go some way to uniting people and, and saying to people We've all had uh, a common experience and we ha have common ground because I think one of the things that has hastened the problems with humanity and brought us to the crossroads is that our society was so divided and we'd become mean. We'd become a mean society, I think. We weren't terribly worried about other people you know we were worried about how things affected us and unless you were completely heartless um you had to be touched by the suffering of people during the pandemic and you know and it's not over yet so what would be a great message to take away is for speech writers to to go forward and inject lots of empathy into their speeches because it comes from a real place of authenticity now it comes from a place of this shared experience um and if i could give you an example of what I mean about this need at the moment for authenticity. Um, the you if you look at US politics, which again it's a common theme. I won't talk about Australian politics because yeah. Um, and not a lot of people know about Australian politics overseas, I don't think, except that we change prime ministers a lot. Um, but in the US, you know, Obama, I think every speechwriter, well, every speechwriter I knew would have given anything for Obama to deliver one of our speeches because his delivery was so good, you know, and you'd think, oh, He's not going to butcher my beautiful words like the speaker I've got at the moment. And believe me, there are a few Australian prime ministers who could really butcher a speech. Um, 
And then we went to Donald Trump. And I'm not I'm not talking politics at here at all here with Obama or Donald Trump. But his style was such a stark contrast to Obama, who had that very formal poetic style of speaking, soaring rhetoric, um, used a lot of devices that we know to use in speeches and used them extremely well. Um, then Trump came along and, and it was, some would say crass, some would say straight down the line, but it was authentic and it was him, except when he was reading off an auto cue and then it was. Mm. And then um, Biden came along and I saw a, a lot of discussion about his inaugural speech, not quite as grand as people had wanted. And I thought, no, it was perfect because. And you've got to look at the context. They had probably written a lot of drafts of it and then the insurrection happened and then they probably had to start again. So his speech was a little bit raw, but it was authentic. And I think when people are as exhausted as the American people are now, um you don't have the headspace to you know poetry can take a little bit of time to process people just want clear messages very accessible language they want to know how this person is going to help me and I think um, Biden's speech did that. So that's it. Yes, we've had a lot of changes as far as speeches are concerned, but it's a great opportunity for speech writers. It's an opportunity for us to use our words to go out and give the world a bit of a hug. So, yeah. I would love to see everybody just just being their authentic selves, their authentic selves or their speakers' authentic selves, and getting out there and using their language to um, to to bring a bit of unity. So thank you very much. You can find me on um, LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, let's hope that we meet again sometime. Have a great World Speech Day. Bye. I was just saying that um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'm continually challenged by the unmute and mute button, but um, thank you very much. And uh, on the note of giving a, using speeches to give everybody a big hug, um, I would like to give you all a very big rhetorical hug uh, for uh, taking part today. Uh, it's been a great pleasure and um, I will circulate stuff and we will, I'm sure, meet again. But Thank you all so much for now. It's been it's been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.